Well, hello again, and welcome to our second episode. Thank you for tuning in. I'm your host, Aaron Diaz, and you're listening to Live the Good Life from the podcast studios of Aaron's Wine Chronicles Corporate Headquarters in the heart of Washington wine country. I'm here with my brother and co-host, Adam Diaz, who you met in our first episode. Hello, Adam. everybody, and I'm excited to be here. Cool. So, today's topic, Wine 101. We call it Wine Basics. Basically, we're going to talk about things that you want to know when you're just getting started in wine. So these are general tips, general guidelines that we've learned uh, over years of going wine tasting and, and meeting people who are experts in wine and talking with people and, and sometimes just doing things on our own because it's all very personal. Wine is a very personal experience. Um, if you want to uh, follow up on this podcast and learn more about getting into wine, you know, check out my wine website at aaronswinechronicles.com or go to winefolly.com. Those are two pretty good sources. Um, before we get into actually talking about the steps of wine tasting and experiencing wine, um, you know, let, let's briefly talk about some concerns that people have when, when it, concerns that keep people from just diving in headfirst into wine. Um, here's one. People uh, sometimes come to me and, and they say that they're intimidated. They're intimidated to go to a winery because they don't feel like they know enough or like they, they just kind of feel intimidated because of maybe, you know, people who talk to them about things they don't know. And it's a, it's a new frontier. You know, as a lot of wineries popped up here, especially in this area, the Tri-Cities um, and Yakima and whatnot, uh, I, I find, you know, when you go into a lot of wineries, uh, you're going to get a lot of help from people that are working the, working the front. And, and they're going to answer your questions. They're going to take you through what they have. They're going to give you what they know about it. And they're a great resource to talk to. So, um, yeah, I haven't experienced a whole lot of, uh, negative issues like that. And I think a lot of people that come in, come into the game, learning it, they're excited to get people in, to bring people into wine. And I just think it can be a good experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think I follow you. I think I kind of know why you probably haven't been intimidated by wine people, but, uh, well, that's a whole nother topic. Well, well uh, how to kill people in three different languages. <laughs> that, uh, uh, yeah, so, but. um, so, you know, and, and there's, there's another topic, um, talking about, you know, the wine lingo, the language, you know, because when, when you're reviewing wines or when you read other people's thoughts, they talk about, you know, certain characteristics of the wine. Viscosity, tannins, things like that. You know, you know I mean, yeah. uh, there's questions people, right. people have about those. Right, and there's, and there's a lot of terms that are in the wine industry that people use, uh, you know, that go right over people's heads. And so I can understand that, you know, learning that takes time. But again, um, it, it, the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be yeah. doing it, and the quicker you'll learn. And like Adam mentioned in just the last uh, topic that, um, you know, people are pretty eager. When you go to wine tasting rooms, the people who are working the front desk and a lot of times just the patrons that are sitting there, they're more than happy to help you understand what's going on with wine. <clears throat> so here's another one. So people have, have mentioned to me, you know, I, I, I tried wine. I've tried it a couple of times and I can't stand it. Well, that was me too. That's true of a lot of people. That was Adam. Yeah. That was, I mean, yeah. when I first tasted Red wine, I didn't like it. As a kid growing up taking sips, yeah. and this I was like, eh. yeah, yeah. Ah. My, our, our grandmother used yeah. to like Burgundy, and of course, it was cheap Burgundy, and and so we, I would <laughs> take sips of her wine, and every single time, I just couldn't stand it. Of course, I was only three years old; that might have been part of it. But um, you know, you're not going to like everything. I, I, you know, my message is keep trying. You know, there's a huge variety of wines out there, and the more you taste, the more confidence you get in your own abilities to t to know what you do like and what you don't like. You know, and, it, it, that's a good point. It, w the first time I actually got into wine and, and our folks were wine drinkers, they, they were helping me put up a, a, a pavers in the back plaza where I was working in the back of my yard. Uh, it was to cover the dead bodies. <laughs> they showed up and they brought a bottle of wine and I was low on beer. I think I only had like two beers or For three God's beers. Sakes. And, and we... <laughs> We drank those. We were out in the sun all day, and then they said, "Hey, well, why don't you have a glass of wine with us?" Like, oh, okay, what the hell, you know? And uh, I can't remember what it was. It, um, I think it was a uh, mom and dad bought it. Yeah, it, it was. It was eh. just probably something you yeah, get it was, at Safeway. It was probably or, a know. good, 
seven, it, eight, nine yeah. dollar bottle. You yeah, know? it I mean, was. It was like nothing wrong yeah. with that. But. And it, it may have been a, like a Merlot or a Cab or something. And and I remember it. It, it just and it could have been just the moment. Mm-hmm. And I just came off drinking a couple of beers. Oh, so you're good I, to yeah. go. And then and it was weird, <laughs> but but it's. It, I drank it, and I had it for the first time. I actually went through the whole glass, and I thought, "Wow, that, that's not bad." And for whatever reason, it just resonated with me, and it, it kind of pushed me to go out and start tasting. And lo and behold, I did. That's how a wine drinker is spawned <laughs> yeah, from beer. <laughs> so that that's what happened well, with me, at least. But when I was a yeah. kid growing up, yeah, I remember tasting. I started out with sweet wines. I started out with, yeah. you know, liking the sweet Muscat Canelli, you know, yeah. 30% by volume sugar. I mean, I'm, it's like Kool-Aid. But then I, I, I further refined myself over years, years and years of wine drinking. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I would say that one other thing that you'll want to remember is that wine can be, you know, immensely satisfying, sometimes alone, just as a sipping drink. You don't need anything. And oftentimes pairing it with food or something that, that, pairs really well with that particular wine, whether it be cheese or cold cuts or, or stuffed mushrooms or whatever the case is. And those are all topics that we'll be talking about in other episodes, hors d'oeuvres and wine pairings and those oh, kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, we some, got a lot to share yeah, about that. classes on that stuff. Yeah. Great. So let's talk about the cost of wine. Yeah. It, uh, it can be kind of spendy, huh? Well, it can be real spendy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, the, when you crack open a bottle of wine, it's usually you're going you're gonna to open it up and finish it, you know. Well, especially if it's red, yeah. right? Because yeah. reds don't typically uh, age well in the refrigerator. After about 24 hours maximum, maybe, you know, a day and a half or two in the fridge or whatever, you, you, you just don't, unless you have a special device that, that you can cover them with, with a yeah. gas, yeah. you know, and, and you recork it. But that's a pain, and a lot of people don't have those things, so... Um, I, I would say that, you know, with cost, I mean, if anybody in the audience has ever been to a, a restaurant where they have a wine list and you've checked out the wine prices, that in and of itself is enough to, for most people to just say, I don't want any part of that. I'm done. It, that's just too expensive. It's, it's out of my league. But, the, you know, there's always a two to three, sometimes four markup, four times yeah. markup on the wines they there. Mark them up, yeah. Um, but, you know, wines can be very expensive. Um, you know, I, I would say that, it, it, you know, White wines, typically, when you go to the store or you go to a restaurant, white wines are going to be less expensive than red wines. Um, and even with red wines, if you get wines that are your everyday type of wines that go with things like hamburgers and pizza and, and that, that kind of stuff, those are generally going to be less expensive red wines. It's only when you get into those more elegant, higher-end wines that have layers of complexity to them and the finish lasts forever and, and they're velvety and, ele- you know, I mean, they're just really good wines. Those are the kinds of wines that you want to use with special occasions and you want to pair them with gourmet foods and those are going to cost you a little bit more. So t- just uh, general tips, that's kind of what you have to look at there. Um, I would say that, um, you know, before I started building my wine collection, I didn't buy wines by the case or buy six of six of one wine or eight of one wine. I just would buy a bottle or two, not knowing that, you know, I might not like it. I might, I might you know, something might happen and I might end up just having to throw it out. So when you're first getting started in wines, you know, taste as much as you can. I, that's, you know, that's what, that's what I would do. I would, I would taste. I, I would say that my number one rule is don't buy wine unless you can taste it. That's why most of the time I buy wines from wineries. I don't, you know, you can't go to Safeway and crack open a bottle and drink it and then put it back on. Well, you might be able to, if, but if you get caught, it's not, it's not so good. Yeah. And some people have a small collection of wines, you know, when they're first starting out. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's important to remember where you're going to keep them, you know, keep them in some place. Oh, yeah. cool. Wine storage yeah. is a big deal. Lay them down sideways so that the corks don't dry out and they're sitting upright somewhere in some hot place in near your kitchen, you know. Yeah. Uh, just, just, uh, there's wine refrigerators and small ones and big ones. And you know, you, you, you hit on a real good topic, which probably could be the subject of an, of another podcast. Uh, storing your wine is really critical. How you Huge. store it yeah, and true. all of that is, is really critical because you can go through a lot of wine and end up having to pour it out if you just put it in your kitchen on a nice rack and your, you know, your temperatures in your kitchen are fluctuating from, you know, 65 degrees in the winter to 80 degrees in the summer. You're, you're going to kill your wine. So yeah. we can talk about that at another time, but that's a good point. Um, but again, um, my advice is if you're just getting started with wine, 
Try as much as possible. The more you try, the more you're going to learn what you love and what you don't like. And that's really what it's all about because, um, you know, there's wine is really personal. We talked about that already. But the one golden rule that I had a lot of people tell me over the years is that there's no right or wrong when it comes to wine. If you experience it and you're tasting X in that wine and somebody else tastes Y in that wine, doesn't matter. What's right for you is what makes the most difference because you're the one that's inevitably going to either buy the wine or not and either drink the wine or not. It's very personal. So we can switch gears, Adam. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about five general types of wines. Um, and so uh, not champagnes or effervescent wines, but yeah. talking like a port style wine, okay? Uh, dessert wine, rosé wine, white wines, red wines. Okay, so you yeah. got five general types. What are some of um, your favorites in those categories? Let's well, just, uh, with a port style wine, and when I, early on when I was tasting, I wasn't a huge port guy. I, I just tried to skip that. It was almost like too brandy-ish uh, type of, now I love them. So it took me a while to get there, but see, with cigar smoking and everything, I learned to to pair a good port with a cigar, and boy, uh, Greg Frechette over at Frechette on Red Mountain, he's mm. got, he had a great Zinfandel-based port. Mm-hmm. I think it was a 2016 or was it a 2015? Anyway, you, know, Bar- you, you became a, a, a wine club member at Bartholomew. What, Bartholomew, they, uh, and he has a Suzao. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's and good. that's an affordable, yeah. just a great little, uh, I think that's about 20 bucks yeah. for a small bottle. But you, you don't need much. You know, if you're sitting mm-hmm. down, that small bottle can, three people can sit there and have a, a good sized glass and, mm-hmm. and, um, and they go well at, with, with a cigar, cigars. With a cigar, yeah. And uh, dessert yeah. wines, dessert wines, you know, can kind of be in a sense that that dessert, that sweet that you like after dinner. Yeah. And so that that's where you get some of the uh, like late harvest uh, Simeon. Uh, oh, Fidelitas. the one from Fidelitas was outstanding. We've had a number of cigars with that. Yeah. With that, with that one, great. Uh, um, goes 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 great in the evening. You know, mm-hmm. to drink that on a hot day. Rosé wines. Um, Chilled whites and chi- and chilled rosés on a, yeah. on a summer day are really good. Yeah, um, and then of course red wines. You know. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Col Solari, one of my great uh, places. I like to and enjoy sitting down and, and tasting at. Always a good experience there. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, they they have a good selection of of reds. Uh, they'll take you through a good line of, of reds. They have a great. What's the Shining Hill? I love their Shining Hill. Mm-hmm. And Cab Sauvignon, the well, Solaris. Well, what about what about temperatures? Serving temperatures. Um, there, uh, there's a a lot of discord necessarily about that. Some people like their their wines all at room temperature. Well, the reds uh, are going to be a, a little bit warmer when you drink them than than the whites. The yeah, ports. I mean, typically, I would I would chill. Obviously, the ports for sure. Yeah, keep them and in the fridge, and then for of course, a while. and yeah. then yeah, whites and and rosés. I'd chill them all. Yeah, so like forty to fifty degrees. If you're last minute, you know you're going to pop open a late harvest or something or a port, throw it in the freezer for yeah, I've know, done that. 15 minutes and then take it out. Yeah. And, you know, especially if you're storing it and it's not as cold as you want it. Right. And uh-huh. then with reds, yeah. kind of 60 degrees maybe to like 70 degrees. Yeah. And if um, you keep them refrigerated, you want to pull those suckers out and let them kind of sit a little bit to kind of yeah. get down to that temperature. Because a lot of times you're keeping them in a the wine fridge, what, it's about 50 something degrees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 54, 55, 56 yeah. degrees. So, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about wine glasses. Now we have, uh, again, um, as we talked about in our first episode, we do both, uh, an audio podcast and a video podcast. And so on the video side, not only do you get the chance to see our beautiful faces, but, um, you also <laughs> can actually see some of the things that we, that we talk about when we're talking about things like accessories for wine drinking or, uh, the types of glasses that we use. Um, and you know, there are all types of wine glasses. Um, typically they're engineered to enhance your experience with the wine, right? So there's an opening to the glass. I mean, uh, Let's see. I've got a glass here that I that I'm going to show you. There's there's the opening to the glass, and then there's the uh, the bowl here, and then there's of course the stem, and and there's the taper. There's the taper from the bowl up to the to the opening of the glass, and those are all engineered 
to enhance the aromas. And when you're, you know, obviously when you're drinking, you're also breathing. Uh, and, and so when you enhance the aromas, you're also enhancing your palate's ability to discriminate flavors. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of, uh, there are wine glasses for specific types of wine. Like, okay, Adam, you, you know, know what, early, early on when I drank wine, I didn't really care. Mason, I, I, mason jars. I would right? grab, yeah, I would grab whatever <laughs> glass. That looks like a wine glass. You know, yeah. take a, boy, uh, now I'm a little picky because I, you know, that wine can breathe in your, in your glass. Right. And, and the, just the way it's shaped, um, allows it to breathe while it's sitting, uh, wine, you know. Shouldn't be rushed. And uh, so, uh, you know, and, and the difference between a stem and a non-stem glass, you know, yep. is you got your warm hand on the glass where the wine is. If you there. don't have a stem. Yeah, and yeah. especially if you're sitting outside and it's kind of warm. And, and that's you know. that's kind of the purpose for the stem, right? Yeah. I mean, you don't want yeah. to be warming your glass with your hand if you have a stemless glass. A lot of people like stemless glasses. I don't. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather not be warming my wine. I'd like to keep exactly. it at, you know, the temperature um, that it was intended. Let's talk a little bit about wine bottles, uh, opening them up with uh, oh. some of the openers. Yeah. Pork the, screws. Yeah. You know, so there are a number of different types of implements, and Adam can show you a, a corkscrew. Yeah, uh, usually there's like a cutter yep. of sorts that might look like something. You just put it on the top, and you 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 peel the outer wrapping on the top before you, you, you put the corkscrew into it. And, you know, you're just going to basically line it up on top of the cork and you're going to twist it. I'm showing it on the camera here. And and I like just a basic corkscrew. I don't need anything fancy. I've had them before, but but uh, I, I just like a basic corkscrew. And, and um, you know, <clears throat> and this goes on the edge of the glass and you're going to pop it out. And uh, and that that's if you have a cork. What if you don't have a cork? True. What if you have a screw top? Yeah. <laughs> You shouldn't you just, need an instruction twist manual that, for you just that. Twist right? that sucker off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so the so, wax, the wax is the one that kind of. Yeah. Eh, what's your take on the wax? You got, you uh, got a way of getting it, those it looks, off. It looks great. Number one, I like. I mean, it looks classy when you have a wax over the top. Red it's like wax. A bottle of Maker's Ford. Mark. You yeah, know, whatever. Yep. But and and it also you know has a secondary effect of sealing. You know, if you have a if you have a cork that maybe wasn't really corked properly or whatever, or there's a little bit of a leak or it's whatever, you know, that wax is going to act as another seal. So that's great. But getting it off can be a real pain in the ass. I mean, yeah. literally. Um, I, I tend to like, uh, you know, this kind of wine opener. I like it. And I know friends yeah, friends good. who are sommeliers and and, and, and wine wine experts and stuff, they, they don't like these at all. They, they think that I'm a, you know, caveman or something. Um, there's, there's this guy here. And this is a, uh, Dur I think it's called a Durand, um, or that's mm. the brand. And this is a special type of, of uh, corkscrew that is great for opening up wine bottles that are very old, where the cork is actually starting to disintegrate. Or crumble, yeah. Yeah, or crumble. That's and, a mess. And that can be a real mess, too. But mm. back to the wax. I'm getting off track here. Yeah. Back to the wax. Uh, my my tip is, and I learned this by by watching, you know, Facebook and Google memes and all these other things, uh, you know, where you take, you have to get the wax to warm up. Now you can take your hand on the bottle and you can literally rub your palm of your hand over the wax until the wax starts to warm up. That's a little primitive. I like to just get some hot water under the tap and just put the uh, bottle, the top of the bottle under the hot water for about 20 seconds. And that'll make the wax kind of soft. Mm -hmm. I immediately dry it off put it on the countertop and drill it. And then you just pop that thing right off and, and it comes off. No problem. You go through the wax into the cork and the wax will break because it's soft. If you don't do that and you try to, to pull the, the, the cork out and you haven't warmed up or softened the wax, you're going to make yourself a whole mess. Yeah. Then you have to score it with a knife and you have to peel it off and you got wax everywhere and you're bleeding and it's just not fun. Anyway. And yeah, and then and so then you get that wine and you put it in your decanter. Yeah. Let it open up. Let it breathe. breathe. And I, man, I breathing's you, the next thing. I have no problem le leaving it there for an hour, 45 minutes, hour, two. Yeah. Two hours I've done. Yep. And, not, and, not a problem. And with me, you know, the younger the wine, the longer I'm going to decant it. Yeah. Um, uh, that's typically the way I do the it. The tannins, the, the, that sharp taste you're going to get sometimes off a of young wine it, or a wine that maybe yeah. hasn't, you know, needs opened to breathe. Up. It just hasn't up. opened up. Yeah, you can reduce some of that from by just letting it breathe. And a lot of people huge. don't have the patience for that, though. No, no. But I tell you, 
get yourself a decanter. I mean, you, you don't have to spend more than $10 to get a decent decanter. I would suggest that you get a decanter that has a wide base to it. Um, and Adam has a decanter over there that he can actually show you. If you get the decanters that look like a thermos, you're not going to yeah. have as much surface area of the wine that has access to air. And you really want, you really want the air to aerate the wine. And, and that's, that's the whole thing about exposing the wine to air so that you can soften some of those and things. And they sell those nozzles that are aerators that you can just pop right. them in and pour. Or, yeah. Or the Venturi. I mean, for, for those science people out there that are into it, what does the aeration do? It just kind of, it just kind of affects the, 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 the effects of the volatile compound, compounds in the, the esters, the alcohols, the acids, and other chemical compounds in your wine. It kind of mellows the effects of those when you aerate the wine. Um, and then there's... there's um, other tools to actually aerate your wine. Um, what I have here is a uh, Venturi nozzle, and it is an aeration device where you pour the wine in the top, and the top has a nice little screen where it can catch sediment and pieces of cork or whatever. That Which might sometimes you'll get in wine. some wines. Oh, yeah, all. sometimes. All, but... um, and, and basically, you pour the wine through here. It's got a couple of air ports, and as the wine goes through... It bubbles, it actually aerates the, the, the wine as it's going into the decanter. Then you let it sit for a couple of hours. It takes, maybe it takes an extra 30 seconds pouring a wine into a decanter through worth a nozzle. It, oh man, but it's it. way worth yeah, it. Way worth it. Um, Adam and I have done taste tests, the Diaz taste test experiment, where we have decanted a wine and then we've taken the same wine and opened it up, cracked it open, and we've drank it side by side. One that's been decanting for two hours, the same wine cracked open fresh. Invariably, it's sometimes like you are drinking two different wines. Night and day, man. Yeah. So it's something you got to do. And that's, again, primarily for red wines. Some people, you know, may have a reason to, to do that with a white wine, but I'm primarily doing that with white wines. So now we're going to move on to the components of wine. There are five primary components that make up wine. One, I guess, I think you would guess, it's water, right? It's mostly water. As a matter of fact, it's about 80 to 90% water. And then there's the component of alcohol. Now, reds, typical reds are anywhere from, you know, mid 13% alcohol by volume to maybe 16% on the higher end alcohol by volume. So then your alcohol is going to be, for a red wine, it's going to be about 13, 14% of that volume. And then you have smaller components by volume. Then you're talking about the acid uh, in, in the wines. And you're talking about your simple sugars like fructose and, 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 and glucose. And then you've got some other chemicals, some uh, phenolic compounds. So um, that's really what makes up your wine. Um, th then there are four key elements. When you're tasting wines, your palate really only reacts to these like four key elements. And there are, there are uh, you know... There's a lot of science behind the tasting and, and how, the, how the tongue works. But the four key elements that make up wine, uh, wine when you're wine tasting are the acidity, the alcohol, the sweetness of the wine, and the tannins in the wine. Those are the four components that really impact your palate. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. We've given you some tips about you know, how to open the wine bottles, you know, how to decant the wine, what to look for, those kinds of things. And now we're going to talk about the process of tasting wine. So this is where, um, you know, th there's a lot of stuff out on the internet, but really you can do this yourself. Basic stuff. It, you, it, it's, it's common sense. It's yeah. like you're using your body, it. right? You're using yeah. your nose, your eyes, your mouth, your senses, right? your senses yeah. as a measurement device. And only you are the only one that's going to be able to read the measurements on those because they're your own personal measurement devices. Mm -hmm. So your eyes are going to tell you about the color and the viscosity. And you can, you can infer and, stuff like the age of the wine from that just by looking at it. And those senses will diminish the longer you're tasting. The more you're tasting, the more wine, you know. Wineries you're hitting, so keep that in mind too. No, you know, yeah, you know, you hit you hit winery number five, and then you decide to buy you know two or three bottles there. Uh, you know, your palate may not be the same. Your senses may be a little dulled because you hit four prior to. Yeah, they'll get saturated, you know? right? I mean, yeah. after a while, it's like wine. All the wine tastes good now because I've been to five wineries and I, you know, yeah. Um, so so when you think about 
you know, what, what your nose does, what your eyes can tell you, and then what your mouth can tell you, you can start to piece together the puzzle of that wine. And every single wine is unique. It's like a fingerprint. So really, the, the five steps that we're going to talk to you about here are taking a look at the wine. And, and there's the, the first thing that I do when I get wine in the glass is I'll try to get something that's white, like the back of a piece of paper, uh, and I'll, I'll put the glass, I will uh, place the glass with, with wine against the white background, and I'll just use the, the ambient light in the room to help me understand the color, the hues, um, and, uh, and the rim variations on that. And, and you can tell a lot about, about the wine. Then you swirl it, and you observe it swirling. You can look at things like uh, uh, the legs. If uh, there's sediment, the, the tears. Yep, sometimes yep. you'll see it. Yep. Stuff like that. And so after you've done your observations visually, then you smell it. Then you start sniffing that wine and you want to take in deep breaths. You know, you want to get as much of the aromas as possible. And the more you do this and the longer you concentrate on it, you'll start realizing that there are kind of like sometimes in some wines, the aromas have layers to them. There'll be like some primary aroma that comes out and slaps you right in the face. Boom. Right. And you're like, Ooh, man, I really get flowers or I get this fruit. Smell, you know, like cherries or so, oak, whatever. Yeah, you can like get that. oak. Yeah. yeah, those kinds of things. Um, and then, and then maybe after smelling it a while, you'll be like, besides that, though, I'm getting like, I can maybe smell like cigar box on this, or, or you know, some, some, you know, maybe wet stone I can smell on it, or something like that. Anyway, there are a number of different attributes that your nose can help you uh, determine when you're experiencing a wine. Um, then the next thing you want to do is you want to taste the wine. So. You know, you, you want to have sufficient amount of wine in your mouth and don't shoot it like a whiskey shot because you're not going to give your body a chance to really embrace the flavors. You got to almost swish it around. Um, if you want to bring a little bit of air into your mouth when you're like slurping the wine in, it'll help bring, you know, air into your mouth. That always helps. Um, and again, you'll be able to, when you're tasting it, you, you want to savor those flavors. You want to swish it around. You, what does it feel like? What does it feel like on the roof of your mouth? What does it feel like on the very beginning of your tongue when it first hits your tongue? And then in the middle, when you're just starting to enjoy it before you swallow it. And then on the finish, on the very back end, you'll often What lingers? Yeah. 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 What, what, what lingers? flavors, what, what, what aromas, what tastes? Textures. Uh, yeah. What lingers with this? And, and it's just kind of a mouth feel type of thing. And yeah, exactly. And then, the, and then at the very end, you want to write some stuff down because wines are, are very diverse Oh yeah. and uh, each wine You'll tells forget. a story. I'm You'll telling forget, you, man, I, I oh, mean, yeah. sometimes I'll, I'll take a marker when I get home and I'm like, okay, I'm eating this with fish, you know, or, or whatever it is that, that, you know, I determined or we discussed with some experts and we, we, you know, we kind of look at, uh, so, you know, this is young, this is going to be, have some tannins on this yep. one. This one needs to sit two years, you know. The other thing you could do when you're at a winery is you can ask either the winemaker or the people at the front desk and say, hey, do you have a spec sheet for this wine? And the winemaker, most winemakers, most wineries will have some sort of uh, technical specification sheet for the wine. And it, it'll give you information about the, the pH, about the uh, alcohol by volume, sometimes the sugar content, the grapes, like if it has 50% Cabernet Sauvignon and 25% Merlot and 10% Petit Verdot, whatever the case is, the breakdown, the composition and those things. It'll tell you how long the wine stayed in the barrels, what type of barrels they used when they were aging the wine. It gives you a whole bunch of information. And you can learn a lot about what you like and what you don't like by gathering those information sheets and, and correlating that with the wines that you bought because you bought that wine for a reason because you probably liked it. So now you can start correlating some of the data behind how the wine was made with the wine. Yep. That's just, that's the scientist in me, but I've been doing that for a while. There are apps, all the apps in your phone. Oh yeah. For wine and oh, cigars yeah. and exactly. you can library and journal stuff in them. Real simple. And you can add pictures while you're there with your phone. Just real. Yep. Quickly. So my brother and I are going to take you through some last minute tips here. Yeah. It's not like a summary because some of these things we haven't really discussed yet. But I will say one of the things that you don't want to do when you're going wine tasting is don't chew gum or pack a dip of tobacco and then wine taste with the gum in your mouth. 
or the tobacco in your mouth, or even do it, you know, 20 minutes before you go in and then spit it out. I, and I, I've tried to drill this into my sister-in-law. I don't want to bring up her name, but her name's Adela. She lives in Southern California. And every time I take her wine tasting, <laughs> she's going to see this and yeah. I'm going to be in trouble. But she's always chewing gum. And I have to remind her, Adela, spit your gum out. Come on. Because yeah. it will impact the flavors. Yeah. I mean, it will. Um, what's the next one? Well, um, you're going to determine whether or not you like a wine. You may not want to pair it right away with food. I mean, if, if you're going out to, to enjoy pairing some food with wine, great. But if you're making a, a determination on, hey, I'm not sure about this wine or these wines, this list, I'm not familiar with them. I might buy. Uh, I want to go through and taste them. Don't, don't hinder yourself and, uh, uh, you know, uh, stumble over eating the wrong things with it or, or pairing something with it because it'll affect your your ability to make a good choice. Like chocolate, for example. You eat, eat chocolate. It makes everything better. Hell, yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes it goes great with I mean, wine. There's been but, many times when I have had wine with chocolate and I bought the wine because I thought I liked it. And then I got home yeah. and I drank the wine without the chocolate and I didn't like the wine. Because, you, you, you know, because your palate's masked. jaded, yeah, you know, it is. it's just yeah. kind of like you want to so stay clear. It and, depends on your objective, you know. right? I mean, if you're out there to enjoy food with the wine, do it because it's great. But yeah. if you're out there to to buy and buy selective wines and kind of build your stock, make sure that you taste the wine first be, without the food so that you can make those determinations with a cleaner palate, right? Yeah, and th then don't, don't be too quick to make a judgment. Like, yeah. I, I used to do this when I was first starting out. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good. I like it. And then once I start saying it enough, you know, it's, it's almost like taste it a little bit. Let it resonate. And sometimes, I mean, they're great. Sometimes you just know. But there, sometimes you revisit. And especially if it's the first winery you're hitting. Oh, yeah, for it, sure. You know, I, you may not have given the first couple ones a fair shake because you need to kind of acclimate your your, your, your mouth to, to, to the wine and those flavors and then go back to it and revisit it and you'll notice a huge difference. And then you're like, okay, that's what I was tasting or that's what I liked or this what I didn't like. It's like when you brush your teeth and then you have orange juice, right? Orange, yeah. ju orange juice never tasted any worse. Yeah. But then if you don't brush your teeth, and you have the orange juice. It tastes beautiful. So, you know, I'm not saying don't brush your teeth. No, it's not what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, you know, I, so the I would. Five S's, yeah. though. Talk about the five S's. Well, the five S's are an easier way to uh, remember the processes that we took you through for tasting the wine. So the first thing you do is you see, you observe with your eyes. You see the wine. Then you swirl the wine, and you continue observing what happens when you swirl the wine in the glass. And then you smell the wine. And then after you smell the wine and you're trying to get those aromas, then you sip the wine. Then you savor the wine, and you try to make either mental notes or physical notes so that you can remember that experience. And there you have it. The five S's. Very simple. The other thing that I, I like to do as a tip is when I'm going into a winery, I will ask the server or the person or the manager of the wine tasting room how long the bottles have been opened. Quite often, wineries will open up the bottles fresh that morning in, in anticipating, you know, patrons coming in and drinking. Other times, at the end of the day, they'll still have bottles that may be half full or even almost all full. And they'll save them overnight, which is great. You can save them overnight. Some, there's a lot of different ways to store them. Wine, wineries know how to do that. But there are rare occasions where you'll get a winery that maybe has stored the wine for too long. Uh, maybe uh, they've had the wine in the bottle with no argon covering it for three days. I went to a place one time where it was over five days they had had red wines just with the cork popped back in them after they had been opened. And I wondered why I didn't like any of the wines. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. And, and from that point on, I always told myself, I'm going to ask how long the bottles have been opened. It, it gives you a better idea of what you're drinking. Um, so there are a whole host of available tools and things that, that you can purchase online to help you with your experience of wine. Uh, I would say that wine journals and, 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 and aroma wheels and scent kits. I've got some scent kits that I, I didn't bring down to show, Adam. They're up on that wine fridge behind the the wall there, mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, like, like wine journals, uh, wine folly makes a really nice wine tasting journal and you can get these online, uh, for relatively cheap and they have 
templates uh, that you can fill out when you're tasting the wine. And it, it's just a way, it's like a journal, and it's just a way of, uh, of documenting your wine experience so that you don't forget because you might like a wine one year and, and then you go back and it appears as if they have the same wine that year, but maybe it's a different vintage. And it can be completely different. That means vintage means year, right? I mean, you had a 2019 Cabernet Sauvignon that tasted fantastic. And then you go back the next year and they have a 2020 Cabernet Sauvignon. Same label, different year. And it tastes not so fantastic. And if you didn't write down some notes or remember that fact, you might buy the bottle thinking, I loved this wine and you're yep. not going to love it exactly, so much. Yeah. So, I mean, taking some notes down, it's really critical. Then there's these things called uh, aroma wheels. And how often have you eaten something and you're like, oh, that tastes like this or that spice is like, but here, it's right yeah. on the tip of your tongue and you can't remember what that flavor is or that aroma is. Well, Adam is showing uh, one of those um, aroma wheels and they have aroma wheels made up for different categories of wine and different uh, varietals of wine and all those things. And yeah, there's they some can good be, information. Though, they can be sure. really, really helpful. And then, of course, um, there are a whole variety of different wine graphics that you can get from Wine Folly. I have a bunch of them up in my wine bar, um, and, and they're very helpful, and they're very educational. So I recommend that you go out to their website and look at some of their graphics. Um, so now I think we're at a time where we're kind of wrapping this up, and we want to talk about some homework. <laughs> Fun homework, the kind you get to, get to uh, actually drink wine. Well, what do you homework. recommend, brother? <laughs> You know, you, you pick a bottle of wine. You pick a bottle of wine and you explore it. So you're going to apply the, the the five S's and apply what we just told you to the wine. You know, whether it's a port, whether it's a... And, and remember, like with ports and some of the dessert wines, you don't have to breathe them for like an hour and stuff like that. You can pop them open. You can breathe them a little bit and pour them pretty much quick, pretty quickly. Uh, but you know, like with the reds and stuff, you're, you're definitely gonna, you're gonna want those to breathe. And, uh, yeah, that's a good know. homework assignment. So we've told them how to taste wine or at least how we taste wine. And if they want to use that, that, uh, template and then, and then go and do that with a wine, you will learn an awful lot if you just take your time, right? Yeah. Take your time and, and slowly go through each of those steps and, uh, and revisit. So, revisit. so like if you have more than one kind of wine or you have two bottles that you open and stuff and, or, or your wine tasting, you're out in the field wine tasting, uh, you know, go back and revisit something you tried early in that, you know, in, in, in those servings, uh, the listings that they, that they give you and, uh, Go back and really kind of be critical and, and kind of see how maybe some of those tastes have changed since since you've gone up through the all the different uh, pours that they give you. Yeah, yeah. So that's your homework assignment, people. I uh, I hope that it's uh, an experience that uh, gets you started and gets you rolling in uh, into enjoying wine because it really will change your life. Um, so that's all we have for today's episode. Again, for more of living the good life, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Aaron's Wine Chronicles, that's all one word, or online at aaronswinechronicles.com. And for the video podcast version of this episode, you can visit my YouTube channel at the at sign Aaron's Wine Chronicles 6666. On our next episode, I'll be interviewing a local barista and a small business owner of Barracuda Coffee. Mr. Jake Shoup, a friend of mine I've known for well over a decade. We're going to be discussing all things coffee and espresso because for all of you good lifers out there, we already know that you start your day with coffee. It's very likely that you start your day with coffee. Everybody does. And if you don't, you probably should. Everybody who's cool. Everybody who's cool yeah. like us. That's yeah. right. So That's right. tune in for that one because uh, <laughs> Jake has a wealth of information about the uh, world of Java. So thank you all for listening. And remember, wherever you go, whenever you can, always live the good life. Until next time. <laughs>